Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday Evening Sermon, our once a month time where we dig deeper into God's Word and really try and tease out a little bit of maybe some of the recent teaching that we've had on our Sunday services. Uh, just chew on the Word of God just that little bit more. And so tonight is likely to be a little bit longer. Uh, and because of the subject matter, because of where I want to go with things, it is much more a kind of teaching session, um, maybe more so than a, just a sermon or a preach. So hopefully you can bear with that. This might be something that you want to keep coming back to, um, or you might want to even pause and come back to things because there's bits of it that um, you might just want to, to mull over uh, and refresh yourself with uh, just as we go through it. So uh, get your Bibles ready. Uh, you might want a pen and paper even just to jot some notes down as we go through things. Because tonight we're going to look at the topic of justice and mission. And we're kind of trying to tease out, is justice part of the church's mission? Because it could be argued that the focus in the New Testament is very much on evangelism. And that evangelism it is what mission is for the church today. And so I want to try and tease into that a little bit um, in our time together. So before we do that, let's take a moment to pray. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So, is justice part of the mission of the church? Now we have to understand clearly that um, the church only has a mission because God has a mission, So, and we're not going into that so much today explicitly. Um, and tied in with this would be maybe sometimes questions like, well, should the church be concerned about care of creation? Um, could that be part of mission? Because um, there's a, a, an ecumenical document that talks about the five marks of mission. And the first couple are about uh, sharing the faith with people, seeing people come to faith, discipling people. So the normal kind of things that we tag on with evangelism and discipleship is probably quite comfortable with that as being part of mission. But then it does talk about justice, I think is mark number four. And mark number five is care of creation. Is, are these part of mission? How, how could we argue for that? And I think the creation care one is part of the kind of justice picture because as we've been seeing, part of uh, the Old Testament argument about justice is, is care of those who are powerless, um, who are vulnerable. And, and it could be argued that, that creation is very vulnerable, particularly as mankind has developed um, capacity and in numbers that we have great power over creation, apart from obviously um, so the great natural disasters that happen, we do have great power and even some of them that we are influencing because of our behaviour. So maybe those kind of things are not mentioned in, in the scriptures um, explicitly because, well, humanity was never in a position to do both beforehand. Um, they cared much better for creation, but even still, could it be argued from the scriptures that creation care should be part of the mission of the church, just like justice could be. Um, and the people that would argue for that probably look back into the Old Testament, as we have been doing with our series in Isaiah. We've been going to the, the Old Testament. Uh, and that raises one of the issues that I want to touch on just as we get into things tonight because there's a, a couple of issues we need to, to touch on initially before we kind of dig into this. Um, because these issues, uh, I think, are sometimes at the heart of why we might not see justice or creation care as part of New Testament mission. Um, the first is, um, I thought that 
I came across in my reading over the summer um, in the book uh, We Need to Talk About Justice by Ben Lindsay. I've mentioned him before and in the uh, evening on uh, Race in Scotland. And uh, later in the book, um, he talks um, about race and theology um, and he talks about this tension between evangelism and a broader understanding of mission. Uh, an understanding of mission that would be more community orientated than just a uh, individual orientated. Uh, and he quotes um, another pastor and academic who says, Generally, in the black church, you learn about Jesus through Moses. White Christians through Paul. That's why they struggle with social issues. And Lindsay says, this author's overarching point is that many black churches promote a theology that leads to Jesus through the Old Testament story of Moses, which tells of a God of justice who hears the cry of his people and saves and redeems them. As a result, black people are presented with the redemption of all things, creation, people, and places. However, the majority of white churches come to Jesus through the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Here, there is a heavy focus on the grace of God for the sinner and the importance of the family of Christ representing the church. The result is that there is an emphasis on personal salvation and community renewal is in the shadows. If your theology and teaching are more Pauline than Mosaic, then it becomes really hard to see how the Word of God applies to social justice issues, whereas the Mosaic starting point allows freedom to articulate why God cares about personal salvation, economics, business, education, etc. I find that a really startling and helpful perspective on it. Possibly pushed a little bit far um, after all, Paul does say uh, in Colossians that, that God um, is redeeming all things and reconciling all things to himself through Christ. And um, so it's, it's probably been pushed a little bit far there. Um, he's obviously trying to make a point. But I wonder if that's part of it, that in white, majority churches, we can be very individual focused and we maybe do form a large part of our theology uh, exclusively through the New Testament and, and I struggle with the Old Testament. Whereas because black majority churches and black Christians and Christians of other ethnic groups have faced slavery, have faced um, conditions that would m more naturally help them feel a sense of um, a unity with the Israelites and Egypt and etc. It's natural that they would maybe then go to the Old Testament scriptures and, and so through that journey to a theology that is more about community uh, and about the renewal of, of much more than just the individual. Not that they would de deny uh, the individual it's just that they maybe try and hold it in greater tension than we do um, at times. And I think part of the influence of our upbringing then is that with regard to the Old Testament, we uh, have maybe a tendency to over-spiritualize it and we gloss over things that are about the physical and about the community um, and, and about creation and, and we fo make a much more spiritual focus on it or we just disregard the Old Testament and so much of it as irrelevant. We don't maybe preach on it as much, we maybe don't talk about it or study about it as much. When was the last time that you really looked at Leviticus in depth, for example? Um, so tonight, we're going to dig into a couple of Old Testament passages and see a little bit of this at work. And I'm also going to quote a couple of sections from um, The Mission of God by Christopher Wright, which I find a really helpful book in helping us to get this um, other kind of perspective on mission and maybe challenge us a little bit 
to equate where we're at. But first, I want us to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, which verses many of you will be familiar with. Paul says to Timothy, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful. All scripture. And of course at the time, he, Paul was talking about the Old Testament. So there's stuff in the Old Testament that is useful and we know it's of God but we, we often don't really think it's very useful. We often just, as I say, I think over-spiritualise it or disregard it. Now, clearly how we relate to the Old Testament is different from Jews. Um, particularly because as we see in the book of Hebrews, um, we have Jesus who is presented as the perfect sacrifice and the perfect high priest. So we no long, longer need the sacrificial system. We no longer need a high priest to offer sacrifices on our behalf. Um, that is provided for by Jesus. So that, that deals away with a great swathe of the Old Testament. Then there's laws in the Old Testament that are about um, the distinction between who is in the people of God and who is not in the people of God and about purity in that sense. And again, because of Jesus, because there is neither Greek, uh, Gentile nor Jew, that distinction is not kept for us in the same manner that it was in the Old Testament about food laws and some of the other laws, um, kind of ceremon ceremonial and um, purity laws and, and such like. So there's something quite different there for us now. But I think from what I've been reading and thinking about this issue of mission and justice, I think somehow we need to hold better the Old and New Testament together so as to reveal a fuller understanding of the mission of God um, so that we don't just treat the Old Testament as some nice old stories um, that laid simply a foundation for Jesus or our nice wee uh, sentimental words of encouragement that we actually see that, that God began his mission in the Old Testament, carried it through the Old Testament and yes, there is a new covenant, but it builds upon what was there previously. And I've tried to touch on some of this in my time here already with talking about the kingdom of God, uh, of the blessing that, that was promised uh, to and through Abraham. But there is more, which is something that's wonderful about scripture. And um, so we're going to turn now to some of those Old Testament passages. Um, one in particular that I have no idea if you've ever looked at it really. And um, we're going to turn to Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus chapter 25 and read a number of verses from here. So Leviticus chapter 25 and at verse 1. The Lord said to Moses at Mount Sinai, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I am going to give you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years sow your fields, and for six years prune your vineyards and gather your crops. But in the seventh year the land is to have a year of Sabbath, rest a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the grapes of your untended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. Whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year will be food for you, for yourself, your male and female servants, and the hired worker and temporary resident who live among you, as well as for your livestock and the wild animals in your land. Whatever the land produces may be eaten. Count seven Sabbath years, seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbath years amount to a period of 49 years. Then sound the trumpet everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land, Consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan. 
The fiftieth year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow and do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the untended vines, for it is a jubilee and is to be holy for you. Eat only what is taken directly from the fields. In this year of jubilee, everyone is to return to their own property. Jumping on a little bit to verse 25. If one of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells some of their property, their nearest relative is to come and redeem what they have sold. If, however, there is no one to redeem it for them, but later on, on they prosper and acquire sufficient means to redeem it for themselves, they are to determine the value for the years since they sold it and refund the balance to the one to whom they sold it. They can go back to their own property. But if they do not acquire the means to repay what was sold, this will what was sold will remain in the possession of the buyer until the year of jubilee. It will be returned in the jubilee and they can then go back to their property. And then at verse 39. If any of your fellow Israelites become poor and sell themselves to you, do not make them work as slaves. They are to be treated as hired workers or temporary residents among you. They are to work for you until the year of jubilee. Then they are, they and their children are to be released, and they will go back to their own clans and to the property of their ancestors. Because the Israelites are my servants whom I brought out of Egypt, they must not be sold as slaves. Do not rule over them ruthlessly, but fear your God. Amen. So, the year of Jubilee is where I want to start in this section. Um, the year of Jubilee, as we see, was meant to be the 49th year, um, seven, seven sets of seven years, and then there would be this year of Jubilee. And we're unsure, actually, if it ever did happen in the life of Israel, sadly. Um, but in that 50th year, they were um, meant to free people from their debts, free people from slavery, that if they had sold land to others because of financial hardship, that they were to get that land back and it would rebalance um, how things were set up when they first came in to the promised land. And we see both that in the later portions that that I read there, but you can go on and, and read the full chapter in Leviticus 25. Now, Jubilee had two main thrusts. It had release and liberty and return or restoration. So you were released from your debts, you were released from slavery, and you were able then to be returned to your your wider clan or your family unit. Um, you were able to, you were free from slavery. And also, if you had sold land, that would be released, that would be returned to you and your property, your financial position, your, um, your honor would be restored. So release, return, liberty, and restoration. And when we read of failures to keep the Sabbath, it's potentially also including this idea of Jubilee not just the Sunday, the Saturday that they didn't keep, or the Sabbath years, but also potentially the Jubilee years. And in the course of Israel's history, this developed into a much wider hope, a longing within the people, and it was picked up and articulated by the prophets. So let's jump on to um, Isaiah chapter 61, okay, Isaiah 61 at verse 1, Isaiah 61 at verse 1, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, of the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of spirit of despair. 
They were called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. And instead of grace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in the land and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. Amen. So, as I say, I think we often approach the Old Testament solely in a very spiritual sense. But reading Isaiah 61, after reading Leviticus 25, I think makes a difference. Because when you start to read those verses, I don't think you just think in spiritual terms. I think there are spiritual nuances there, but I think it's more as well to proclaim freedom for the captives those who have sold themselves because of debts and now because jubilee should have happened, because Sabbath should have been recognised and honoured and followed, there should have been freedom for the captives to proclaim the year, the year of the Lord's favour, the jubilee year, to comfort those who mourn, to provide for those who grieve to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, oil of joy instead of mourning because they're in slavery and because they, they don't have the land that they once had and have had to sell it. To rebuild what has been lost. That instead of disgrace, verse 7, you will, re you will rejoice in your inheritance. Their inheritance was the land. It was what God had given each family, medium-sized clan unit to have so that they had provision for them and they've had to sell that and so they're in slavery and they, so they're in disgrace and they're lacking honour and because of Jubilee they, that was meant to be restored to them because the Lord loves justice He loves justice I think it, it's, it's laden with jubilee language. That freedom of the, the captives, good news for the poor, the year of the Lord's favour, inheritance instead of disgrace. But we're trying to understand, well, what about New Testament mission? And so let's jump on into Luke chapter 4 in the New Testament where we read about Jesus. Okay? Luke chapter 4 at verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in, in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And rolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Amen. So Jesus picks up the words of Isaiah. And again, we, we have that tendency to, to spiritualize every part of it, don't we? But you know, there, 
how many are the commentators that um, w would say, well, this person was healed, the leper was healed, or the blind man was made to see, and that uh, the paralyzed man was able to, to walk, and, and these were not only healings and not only generated faith, but they would give that person back life because then they could work. That, that is, is picked up in so many commentators. So when the kingdom comes, and in the ministry of Jesus, it's not just about faith. It's not excluding faith, it's not excluding spiritual dynamics, but it's not just. And the gospel, the good news, is not just that you can be forgiven your sins. When Jesus came and he started preaching, he says, the good news is what? The gospel is what? Can you remember? Repent and believe the good news for the kingdom of God is near. The gospel is actually about the kingdom of God, not just about forgiveness of sins. And so in all of this, I guess the question arises, how big is our, your understanding of the gospel and of the cross and of the mission of God? Um, so I, I'd like to qu quote uh, a little bit from Christopher Wright because when I was going over this, uh, once more I was just struck by it. Um, he, he writes uh, so, so powerfully. So a couple of, couple of sections that we'll, we'll just listen to just now. It is a distorted and surely false reading of Scripture to argue that whatever the New Testament tells us about the mission of the followers of Christ cancels out what we already know about the mission of God's people from the Old Testament. Of course, the New Testament focuses on the new thing that we now have to proclaim to the nations. Only from the New Testament can we proclaim the good news that God has sent his Son into the world. God has kept his promise to Israel. Jesus has died and is risen and is even now reigning as Lord and King. In the name of Jesus Christ, we can know forgiveness of sins through repentance and faith in his blood shed on the cross. Christ will return in glory. The kingdom of God will be fully established in the new creation. All of these great affirmations and much more are the content of the good news that could only be made known in the New Testament through the historical events of the Gospels and the witness of the Apostles. And of course, it is our mandate, duty and joy to proclaim these things to the world in the evangelistic task entrusted to us. But where do we find any justification for imagining that by rightly understanding what the New Testament commands us to do, we are absolved from doing what the Old Testament commands. Why should we imagine that doing evangelism in obedience to the New Testament excludes doing justice in obedience to the Old? Why have we allowed what we call the Great Commission to obscure the, quint the twin challenge endorsed by Jesus himself of the Great commandment. I just find that so so powerful and hard hacking and really just hits me and and it just makes me want to approach the Old Testament anew and in, in different ways and and see that it has relevance and that God has been doing and building things for millennia and that it culminated in Christ, in Jesus coming and, and in what he's doing and, and in what we have to share. Yes, there's that evangelistic task, there is calling people into that. But then when we are discipling people, what we are discipling them to is maybe much greater than we've ever imagined. Christopher Wright goes on to say, God's mission was that sin should be punished and sinners forgiven 
Evil should be defeated and humanity liberated. Death should be destroyed and life and immortality brought to light. Enemies should be reconciled to one another and to God and creation itself should be restored and reconciled to its creator. A huge vision of what God is doing as revealed through the scriptures. He goes on to say, a full biblical understanding of the work of Christ on the cross goes far beyond, though of course it includes, the matter of personal guilt and individual forgiveness. That Jesus died in my place, bearing the guilt of my sin as a voluntary substitute, is the most gloriously liberating truth to which we cling in glad and grateful worship with tears of wonder that I should long for others to know this truth and be saved and forgiven by casting their sins on the crucified Saviour in repentance and faith is the most energising motive for evangelism. All of this must be maintained with total commitment and personal conviction. So we hold on to evangelism, we hold on to calling people to repentance, to saying that every one of us is a messed up sinner and we need the forgiveness of God. That is not in debate, that is not up for dropping any time. But he says, but there is more in the biblical theology of the cross than individual salvation. And there is more to biblical mission than evangelism. The gospel is good news for the whole creation. To point out these wider dimensions of God's redemptive mission is not watering down the gospel of personal salvation. Rather, we set that most precious personal good news for the individual firmly and affirmatively within its full biblical context of all that God has achieved and will finally complete through the cross. Of Christ. Only in the cross, only in the cross, is there forgiveness, justification and cleansing for guilty sinners. Hallelujah! Only in the cross stands the defeat of evil powers. Only in the cross is the release from the fear of death and its ultimate destruction altogether. Only in the cross are even the most intractable of enemies reconciled. Only in the cross will we finally witness the healing of all creation. The fact is that sin and evil constitute bad news in every area of life on this planet. The redemptive work of God through the cross of Christ is good news for every area of life on earth that has been touched by sin, which means every area of life. Bluntly, we need a holistic gospel because the world is in a holistic mess. And by God's incredible grace, we have a gospel big enough to redeem all that sin and evil has touched. And every dimension of that good news is good news utterly and only because of the blood of Christ on the cross. There is no other power, no other resource, no other name through which we can offer the whole gospel to the whole person and the whole world than Jesus Christ crucified and risen. I'll probably put up uh, scans of just a few of those pages so that you can go back and, and look at them more easily. Uh, and if you want a copy of the book then, or a loan of my copy, then just let me know. I just did not know how to summarise some of that. And so forgive me for quoting so lengthy sections. But sometimes we need some meaty stuff to chew on and to hear. And so that's what I've chosen to do tonight. I hope you can see where I'm coming from. I hope you can see what is nurtured in my thinking and in my heart, this understanding that the mission of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ is huge and is relevant for every area of life. 
and thus why justice is part of the mission of God and so the mission of the church and why I've felt called to preach about this these past number of weeks. Friends, I I hope tonight has provided some food for thought, Uh, uh, maybe a, a wider biblical foundation than just what we saw in Isaiah and begins to to nudge us, convict us maybe even if that's needed, Um, affirm that that call that some of us have because I I was talking to to someone uh, just through this series and, and the church has never affirmed her occupation. I won't go into what it is, but the church has never affirmed, not Brighton's parish church, not any church, because I think we probably downplay issues of justice and we elevate evangelism. And maybe we do that because we think one is eternal and and so we, we do the eternal over the temporal. And in Brighton's we do that with the Kirk session in the Deacon's Court, we look over the eternal matters and the temporal matters. But that's another story and another conversation. But this individual had never been affirmed by the church, never once in decades of work. But by talking about justice, by seeing that justice is crucial and important because it is at the heart of God and it's at the heart of God because it's part of the mission of God or vice versa, that it's part of the mission of God because it's at the heart of God. That brought a measure of affirmation for her. She could see that in her work, she is bringing the light of Jesus. She is bringing good news for the poor and hopefully freedom for the captives. And that it is more than just spiritual, that it includes the spiritual, but it is more than just the spiritual. So friends, uh, I will be interested to hear what you have to say. Give me some feedback. Um, Give me a call, uh, arrange to go for a walk if that's permitted um, in due course. Um, But, Let's wrestle with this. Because I really do think it's there in the scriptures, it's there in the heart of God. And some way, somehow, needs to become much more. There are echoes of it, certainly. There are clear signs of it in parts of us as as Brightons. But maybe, maybe we just need to have that wider biblical understanding of things to to give us that nudge to bring that degree of challenge as we were looking at on Sunday. I hope tonight has been helpful and that God speaks through this to equip us and call us. So let us take a moment to pray. Let us pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, What was of you, would you take it deep into our hearts and minds? Would you transform and renew our minds that we would follow in your ways, that we would take on the character and the heart of Jesus more fully? And Lord, what was of me, what was just dross, would you just blow it away? that it wouldn't take root, that it wouldn't unsettle us. May there not be any attack of the enemy that would um, bring a guilt that is heavy and uh, ill-fitting. But would we, if we are challenged, simply have the 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 discipline, receive it as a discipline of our Father and know forgiveness and know his, your enabling to, to lead us into life that all might have life. Lord, 
lead us in your ways. Help us to see the injustices around us. Help us not to be complacent as we've heard. Not to be thinking, well, I'm just one little person. What do my choices matter? Because they do, Lord. Each of our choices matter. And when we collectively pull together, then then incredible things happen. And even on an individual things level, credible things happen. So Lord, Lord, lead us in this. Lead us to know how to engage with our community, our wider area, even the wider issues of the world, as we seek justice and defend the oppressed. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, thanks for joining us tonight for our Tuesday evening sermon. And uh, in the description there'll be some links uh, so you can get a, a scan of the pages I read from tonight. Um, do join us Thursday evening for live prayer at 8.15 and in the morning there's also the open time of prayer at 10am if you're able to join us. You do need to book in advance for that one. And we'll be back on Sunday. This Sunday it's Remembrance Sunday. We'll be starting at the earlier time of 10.45 with music and notices from 10.30 so that at 11 o'clock we can show um, our and have our mark of remembrance uh, at 11 o'clock. So join us then if you're able. And as you go from here, the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you this night and forevermore. Amen. Yeah.